be looking at verses 14 and following. Ambassadors in a foreign land. I looked up the definition of an ambassador according to Marion Webster. She seems to know a lot. An ambassador or is an official envoy, a diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as, a, as, the rep, as the resident representative of his or her own government or appointed for a special, often temporary, diplomatic assignment. And uh, one, one definition talked about being a distinguished diplomat. And I want to tell you a story. Uh, in 1997, I was uh, privileged to be invited to lunch at the ambassador's house in Costa Rica, uh, in, uh, in San Jose, Costa Rica. Um, I was able to uh, go to his home, have lunch uh, with him. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about it, I wrote some notes. It's very memorable, but... Um, we could, we had, he, he had all kinds of foods that were from America. He wanted to make sure that we felt uh, comfortable and at home and just very hospitable. Beautiful setting in a home that was uh, overlooking San Jose, Costa Rica and um, just had a wonderful time at his home and, and I didn't get to know him very well but I did get to speak with him and it was just an honor. And as I tell you that story, um, if you're impressed now, uh, when I fill in the blanks of what I haven't told you, you will be less impressed. Uh, I was taking, I took a group of, of, of teens and adults on a mission project to, uh, to Puerto Rico, or to Costa Rica. And uh, it was over the 4th of July. And every year at the 4th of July, the ambassador to, of, from the United States has a dinner or lunch on his compound. And he invites every American who is in San Jose and would like to visit his home to come. So at first it sounds like I was distinguishedly invited. Uh, and I guess I was with every other American. And uh, there were food tents of Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Pizza Hut, uh, Good Humor Ice Cream, Krispy Kreme or Dunkin', I, it was that kind of thing. It was, a, it was kind of a festive event, and it was at his house. Uh, I did not get to go in his house, I didn't say that, but um, I did get to meet him. And I wanted to tell you a little bit, I lead up to tell you a little bit about that story of meeting the ambassador. Um, we were there walking around, and you know, the hopes of, can I meet our ambassador from the United States? And as we're walking around eating whatever we could eat and all that we could eat, um, uh, there was a gentleman far off walking around introducing himself to the people. And, uh, and I found out that that was our ambassador. And I was shocked. Because our ambassador walked out with an umbrella hat on of the American flag. And he was dressed like Uncle Sam. He looked like a clown. And, and I, I, think, I tell you that story because the idea of an ex distinguished representative of uh, a country, in our case the Lord, really comes into play. Because we do represent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I looked at that story and I'm thinking, he was not impressive at all. Did we enjoy the food? Sure, I enjoy food with, with or without him. But, but what was interesting is, is that he really, to me... Um, put a damper on, on even what our country looks like and is represented. And, and I don't know the man at all, and I may be, you know, I am passing judgment uh, on him, but it was just that appearance. So when we talk about a distinguished representative, I want to take a chance, I want to take an opportunity and read 14 through 21. So if you have your Bibles, turn there, and we'll read through it and then work, work our way through the text. In verse 14 it says, For the love of Christ compels us or constrains us, because we judge this or thus, that if Christ, if, that if one died for all, then all died. And he, di and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 
Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So as we unpack this passage of scripture, there's a lot here, but I want to look at it in th- based under three different categories. And Paul starts in verse 14 with, I believe, what we would call our, our motivation. He says, for the love of Christ compels us or constrains us. And that's interesting because that phrase constrained, Paul also used in a different place where he says we're hard pressed or we're pressed in around and that's the idea. And and when we think about this, the love of Christ constrains us, It, it wraps us up. And I think of what is the motivation for an individual like myself or you to go out and share the gospel with someone in this world that maybe is not like us, that maybe is someone where we don't like maybe how they live or how they act, or what would compel us to even do that? And he starts right here. Pastor Kevin last night talked about how in his passage in in 1 Thessalonians 4, how it's the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, and it's repeated over, the Lord. And I think about that. Where do we start? Where does Paul start with you and I as ambassadors for Christ. We, when, when we look at that, we think, well, he starts with us. He does not. And in verse 14, he says, for the love of Christ compels us. And the first thing that comes to mind, is my mind, a verse, is, is Romans 12. Based on the mercies of God, I beseech you to what? To present yourself as a living sacrifice. And the idea behind that is what? Surrender. I am surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's an easy life? No, it's the love of Christ that I have experienced is why I want to serve Him. And quite frankly, let me just point this out or say this, because I've lived it before. There are often times in my spiritual life, in your spiritual life, I'm sure, that when we are not in tune with the love of Jesus Christ, and it what? It shows. When we are one with Christ, walking with Him, there is a desire to see other people come to know Christ as Savior. We proclaim the only, that Christ is the only way or, of God's answer for man's salvation. Again, Paul says in, in Colossians 1, don't turn there, 28 and 29, he says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man, not just believers, complete in Christ. And when Paul talks about the love of Christ compels us or constrains us, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him. That's the motivating factor. It's not how nice people are. It's not what socioeconomic position they're in. It's the person that's on the street. It's the person in the high rise. It makes no difference what they are, how they act, what they look like. It's God's love that moves us in that direction. Because quite frankly, if it was not God's love, we would not move in that direction. We would not need to. We would not want to. What is it that, you know, I'll use this example, but what is it that makes the missionary go to the tribe that is completely different from anything they know back in Iowa where they're from. What is it? What is it? It's that love that Christ has shown to them. And because He loves us, we can love others. He says, 
he says the love of Christ compels us. And then he doesn't stop there because he makes another statement and says, because we judge thus that if one died for all, speaking of Christ, and notice what it says, he died for who? Not just the elect, and that's a false teaching. He died for all, for the world. And we have this, he, he died for all, and, uh, and what, what else does it say there? He said, died for all, then all died. And I believe what he's teaching here is this. Christ died for all because mankind is dead in their trespasses and sins. The current situation of mankind outside of cross is de- uh, the cross is dead. As a result of sin and the curse of sin through Adam, all mankind is spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you he made alive who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. And we have to understand something, folks. That's where you were and that's where I were before Christ. And I'm sorry to say that if you are not in Christ through salvation, that's where you are today. But that's not where it ends. That's not where it's supposed to end. He says this, For the love of Christ constrains me or compels me um, because, or us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all died. Verse 15, And he died for all, that those who live... Now, I want you to notice, he goes from all to those who live, from the world to those who have received Christ as Savior. And he says, for all those who live should what? No longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. There's that love of God demonstrated in the cross of Christ. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a motivation to serve. That's why when you go to a passage like in Titus 2 where he says the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, what is the motivating teaching factor there? It's the grace of God. Because as we look at ourselves, honestly, I mean, we, we dress nicely. We, you know, we want to comb our hair. We don't want to smell if we can help it. I went into church one day. My friend Steve Johnson, um, Terry is here from Minneapolis. He would know Steve. Uh, Steve, um, he's a really good friend. He's the kind of friend that can tell you if something's wrong and you say he cares. He's not just being mean. Um, I had been out to an Italian restaurant with a group of people the night before, and so I came into church, and he goes, Robert, you stink. <laughs> or you stinketh, uh, according to Lazarus. <laughs> and I, okay, well, why? He said, you smell like garlic. And I do, I do bathe regularly, so please. Um, but, but the idea of, of being honest, and, and he says here, he says, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him. And what I was getting at in that is this. Um, We we, want to look nice, and we want everybody to see us in a certain way. But the fact of the matter is, as we sit here, there's not one of us that deserves one drop of God's grace. And yet, if you think of the Niagara Falls as God's grace, that's being poured on our heads every moment of every day, every breath. We don't deserve it. And this verse gives us the the motivation. He says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. What a powerful statement. And verse 16, interesting verse. Therefore, from now on, we recognize or regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet we now know him thus no longer. And it's interesting because in this verse, I think what he's saying is what I mentioned before. We don't look at people based on how they dress. We don't look at people based on what kind of car they drive or what what status they are in life. All mankind needs to be saved. And they are savable because of what we read later in the text in Christ dying on the cross and bearing, being buried and rose again for salvation, providing it. He died for all that man might have the opportunity to be saved. 
And then we continue on in the text, continuing that idea of motivation. The love of Christ motivates me. Um, I'm, I'm no longer to live for myself, but for Him. Well, why for Him? Because He died on the cross, was buried and rose again with me in mind and with you in mind. And then he says this, therefore, don't look around at people in their status in life. And I thought about this in relationship to the nation of Israel. The outward appearances of, of the sacrificial system, of the keeping the feast days, all that went in, into their, their religion and their connection with God. And I look today, and Paul is saying, erase all that. You look at people through the eyes of the spiritual life. Are they, if they're, they, they may be walking, they may be looking nice, but they can be the walking dead, spiritually dead. And sometimes, and if you're honest with yourself, I believe that you would agree with this, sometimes the way a person looks does get in the way of how we approach them. Um, we've been in situations where you, you say, well, that person would never want to know Christ, and you back off. The fact of the matter is, sometimes it's that person is so ripe for the gospel that you need to press through the awkwardness and talk to them and let God do the work because it's not about us. So our motivation is this, this beautiful love of Christ. And it just keeps getting better because in verse 17 he says, Therefore, therefore we don't recognize anybody according to the flesh. Therefore, if any was one is what? In Christ. Remember, he died for all, but now he's talking about those of us who are in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And I want to just ask you to think about this for a moment in your own walk with the Lord, in your own salvation. When you got saved, did things become new? Did your outlook change? Did your understanding begin to change? Can you think back to when you didn't know Christ and what you looked like then and what you thought then? I'm not saying that you're perfect now because I know you're not. I'm not. But when we look at this verse, it really comes to life when we realize the dramatic change that took place as a result of God in working in us and through us through the gospel. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. Everything becomes new. And he gives us some examples in the context. If you go back to chapter 4, he says in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. What does that mean? It means the Spirit of God is at work in our lives day by day as we submit to the Lord. The Spirit of God is at work. If you look at verse 5 of chapter 5, he says, Now he who has pre prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. You didn't have that before Christ, nor did I. So we have a new, a new indwelling of God's Spirit. Chapter 5 and verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Do you realize right now that you have a place, a home that's not here? We have a new home. Have we ever talked to people and asked them, do you know if you were to die today you'd go to heaven? And they say, I hope so. We know so. Because of our relationship with Christ. What a motivating factor. We have a new indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have a new home. We have a new hope. Verse 4. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Folks, do you realize that that last part of that verse throws our understanding of death on its head? Because here's what we think, and even Christians think this and, and, and deal with it like this. I'm, I'm getting old and I'm going to die. And, and you, you're getting old and you're going to die. I'm sorry to give you that information. Um, however, look what he says, that my, my mortality, which means dying or death, will what? See, what the world looks at is death is it. And if I go to heaven, I go to heaven. If I go to hell, it might even be better than heaven. And that's what they think. But the fact of the matter, he says that my life will be swallowed, my death 
will be swallowed up by life. And I believe what he's saying is it's an opportunity to look for positively toward the future. And as believers, our hope is in the Lord. And we have a new home. We also, a new hope. We also have a new purpose. I love what it says in verse 9. In the same context, therefore we make it our aim, whether to be present with the Lord or absent, to do what? To be well-pleasing to Him. Our motivation is the love of Christ. Our motivation is that He died on the cross and was buried and rose again on our behalf. Our motivation is that we see everything new because we are new creations in Christ. And then he moves on in the text, and I, I, I look at this as now God's provision or our message. Our motivation is the love of Christ. Our message is God's provision for all mankind. And let's go on in the text in verse, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And I'll just mention the word ministry there is where we get our word deacon or diakonos or servant. So when we think of being that servant of the Lord, we serve him. We serve at the behest of our king, master, God, Lord, as his re distinguished representatives here on this planet. He said he's given us the message of ministry of reconciliation. That is, and he's explaining it, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world, the world, not just certain people, to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word or the statement or the declaration of reconciliation. <coughs> now, I want to make a couple of comments here because there's some things here that are sometimes confusing to people. And I want to just read a couple of things to you. And the first is this. When we think of God's provision, God has provided the only avenue of reconciliation to mankind through Christ. There is no other way to heaven. There is no, if, if you can say, I, and people talk about working their way to heaven, being good. If you could do that, then there's no need for Jesus Christ. No need for the death, burial, and resurrection. God in Christ has made and key in on this word, provision for all through the Lord Jesus Christ in that Christ's death on the cross was for the sins of the world. While the provision has been made for all mankind, man must receive the Lord Jesus Christ as his payment. Christ is not going to keep dying every time you accept Christ. It happened. Peter says it was the for the just, for the unjust, once and for all. Now, as we look at this, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about God providing an avenue or a provision whereby we can be reconciled. Not that we already are reconciled, because we are not. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. I'll read a quote by John Walvoord, who was the longtime president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and I love the way he puts this. He says, The appeal is that God has already provided reconciliation for all, but it is effective only when received by personal faith of the individual. The contrast between provision and application. Provision is for all, the application is for those who believe. Those who are already reconciled to God are, amb are the ambassadors through whom the message is delivered to those who have not yet availed themselves of the mercies of God. And as I think about this, I think of the issue of provision and application. Because he died once for all. He provided the payment, the only payment for all of mankind to have a relationship with Him. But then I think it, in the sense of corporate provision, personal application. He died for all, but until I receive His gift, 
I'm lost. In, in fact, I'm, re, I'm in a sense, whether I realize it or not, rejecting him. I don't need it. I believe that I can work my way to heaven. So I ignore it. I may even say I don't like God because I look around at all the bad things. I don't want anything to do with him. Well, I'm left on my own. Now let me ask you a question to think about, not to answer, because I'll answer it for you. Is this, how long does that provision last? I'll tell you how long. Let's, if you just turn over, I have to turn the page to chapter 6. And he says, what, what, what we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So how long does the provision of God's redemption and salvation in, in, for mankind, how do, how, when's, when is the expiration date of that? I can tell you when it is. It's when you die. See, because up until death, you have the opportunity to accept that. And we've all known people. I led my brother to Christ who was dying of cancer. And he died knowing Christ as his Savior. We've all heard stories about that. And the fact of the matter is, once you're dead, it's on you. And, and I, I love what the Apostle Paul, in recounting his, uh, his salvation to Agrippa in Acts 26, because sometimes we look at that verse and we go, well, Christ died and he had not imputing our sins to us. Um, and so, so that must mean that we're all saved, universal reconciliation. And let me tell you, that's a heresy. That's a heresy of the worst kind. We are, you don't, if you don't know Christ, you're dead in your sins now. No matter if the provision has been made, the application has not. Now Paul says in Acts 26, 18, again talking to Agrippa, notice what he says. He says, talking about his, his calling, I'll read verse 17. He says, I will deliver, recounting what Jesus said to him, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Well, wait a second. Didn't he say that Christ, God, was not imputing their sins to them? While a person is alive, we have the opportunity to trust Christ. But Paul himself was saying that he was called to lead people and to show them how they can have what? Forgiveness of sins. You were dead. He hath, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And he, I think it's Romans 5 where he talks to us about being enemies of God. So God's provision, our message, is that Christ died for your sins. He made the provision, but unless you receive it by faith, you cannot have that applied to you. And if you die without receiving it and stand before God, He's going to expect your payment, and your payment will not get you there. You will be dead in your sins, or still dead in your sins. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been what? Justified by faith. We have peace with God. Verse 10 says, listen to this, verse 10 of Romans 5. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Enemies now reconciled through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen through whom we have now received the reconciliation. See, a lot of times we think of reconciliation as two people who've had struggles and we get them back together and they're reconciled. God has no struggles. God did not do anything wrong. And what is the beauty of God's grace and mercy is the God who did not do anything wrong provides the way that you and I who've done everything wrong 
can walk into his presence. And not only when we pass from this earth, but we are living eternal life now. Romans 6, 1 talks about walking in what? Or 6, 3, I think. Walking in newness of life. So our motivation is the love of Christ. Our mission is to preach. Verses 18 and 19. He says, Now all things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word or the declaration of, of his gospel, the declaration of reconciliation. Our goal is to tell people that God has provided a way already, and you must receive it by faith just like we did. And then I, I, I've, I've, I've put the last couple of verses. We have motivation, we have mission, and God's message, but now we have our calling. And it's all through this text, but if you notice in verses 19 through 20, verse 19 ends with, He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Um, in verse 18, He says He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And, and again, those point to the fact that man needs to be what? Reconciled. That they're not already reconciled. The text explains itself. They're not already. They're not, just because it says he died for all and he's not imputing their trespasses to them, but while they're alive, they have the opportunity to receive Christ. They are not reconciled until they do receive Christ. And then he says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you, we beg you on Christ's behalf. Because you're not yet reconciled, be reconciled to God. It's interesting because the idea here of implore is to, I want you to be reconciled. I desire you to be reconciled. I beg you to be reconciled. And let me say this, the you is, the you is not in the text, not in the originals. He says, for then, we, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore. The you is added. We implore universally. Be reconciled to God. It's not just about the Greeks or the people in Corinth. It's all, including them. We implore, we beg, be reconciled to God. We are declared to be distinguished diplomats authorized to speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what do we speak? That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that you need to come by faith and receive what he did. Um, it's receiving that, that payment on your behalf. I grew up in a, in a home that wasn't a Christian home. My mom, I believe, was a Christian, but she'd gone her own way. And um, I went to Fulton Road Christian grade school as a young, unsaved pagan boy, and, it, and I proved it over and over again at Fulton Road Christian grade school. Um, I learned Bible verses at, Christ, at Fulton Road Christian Grade School. Uh, and my first grade was a D, and my mom goes, you got a D in Bible? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And uh, then, it was because it's Bible memorization. Then I got it up to a B, and everything was good to go. Um, I could memorize it. I knew, and you know what? I knew what Christmas was about. It was about the birth of Christ and a lot of gifts. As a kid, I knew what the Easter was about. It was about Easter eggs. No, I knew it was about the resurrection of Christ. I was taught it at Fulton Road Christian grade school. But you know, I was lost. The fact of the matter is, people, a lot of people know about Jesus, and they know about what he did on the cross, and they know about his resurrection. Whether they believe it or not, they know it. And the message of reconciliation as we ambassadors is to tell them that it's for them. We talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew all the stuff, but it wasn't until I was told, Robert, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And I answered yes. Well, how do you know? Because I'm a good kid, 14 years old. 
in my head, because you know why we think we're good? We compare ourselves to somebody who's worse than we are. Happens all the time. And he went on to show me that that didn't matter. I needed to trust Christ and what Christ had done for me. And I did. But now we are in this, he says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to beg and implore those who don't know Christ, listen, be reconciled to God. Know Christ, come to Christ. It's, it's, it's through him and a relationship with Christ. And that's our responsibility. And I will point this out, that our responsibility is not to save anyone. It's just to present the gospel. And hopefully do we do it in, not like a clown wearing an American hat or Uncle Sam, that we do it in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I honestly believe this. When we talk to people, they may turn us off, but sometimes when you really care about someone, they, they understand that. And even if they do blow you off, they're listening. And God's working, even though sometimes we don't see it. And I want to end with something, and these are not mine. I didn't come up with these. Um, I found them somewhere years ago. But when it talks about being an ambassador, just a couple of characteristics of an ambassador, and then we'll, we'll be done here pretty soon. And that is this. Um, an ambassador is given a special appointment from his or her sovereign or nation. A special appointment. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1.9 says this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. There's power in the gospel. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began. You and I, as a result of our salvation, are called ambassadors. We are given a holy calling with a holy purpose. To not be ashamed of the gospel of the God's grace, the gospel of salvation, and to go alongside people and introduce them to the Savior who saved us. An ambassador is given a special appointment. The second characteristic is this. An ambassador does not belong to the country he or she is being sent to. Well, wait a second. I live in Wisconsin. No, yes, I do. But that's not my home. But when, when all things became new, I got a new address too. And it's not on Algoma Street in Port Washington. An ambassador does not belong to the country he or she is sent to. And I'm not going to, I'm just going to read these words because Pastor Kurth is going to pick this up tomorrow. What does it say in Philippians 3.20? For our citizenship is in heaven. I'll end it there. This is not our home. This is not our home. This is very temporary. This is very temporary. And we know that because we know loved ones who have gotten diagnosis of things and have this is we, we expect to go on for a long time, right? The older I get, the more I look for the Savior. At 20, I was saved, but I was okay with being 20. I'm 57, and my knees aren't 20. And you, you see what I'm saying? We are looking for that. The expectations of we're going to just all live a long life are in our head. It may happen, but it may not. And the fact of the matter is, we have a different home to go to. That that mortality will be swallowed up by life. So, we are given a special appointment. We, are, we don't belong here as citizens. We're citizens of heaven. The third one is, an ambassador does not put his or her self-interest at the forefront. I'm not, our ambassador, and I don't know him other than I said hi. I didn't say hi, you look like a clown. I just said hi. Thought he looked like a clown. But, I mean, you know how that goes in politics. People like to be ambassadors because you get paid to enjoy, you know, living somewhere else. I heard Nancy Pelosi wants to be the ambassador to Italy. God bless her. Forget, I'm not, I could go further, I'm not, but okay. Um, I'm going to ask for forgiveness right now before the Lord for bringing that up. 
But that's true. That's in the news. You can believe anything on the news. I read it on the internet. Um, but, but listen, um, does not have personal interest here. Paul says in Ephesians 4.1, um, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. One of the most precious passages of Scripture for me is 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, where Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Wait a second, that's Paul saying that. Paul, who was a, a, a Pharisee, Paul, who had sat under the feet of Gamaliel, Paul, who probably was a pretty sharp guy. I, he says, I didn't come with you to, with excellency, excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. How many of us can, can identify with this? And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest or should not be in the wisdom of men, but where? In the power of God. He's not looking for used car salesmen. He's not looking for looking at someone who tells... Have you guys ever been to a timeshare sale? Oh, my Lord. I mean, I'm ready to... Where, where's my wallet? Here, I want one. It's the last one for sale. You know, my wife and I sit in the, sit in the parking lot and say, okay, we're not going to buy, we're not going to buy. We go in and we're ready to buy. We, thankfully, um, the Spirit of God came upon me and we did not buy but that's not what God's looking for. And those guys can sell. Or ladies. And you, you know, that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for humble servants. Humble servants. Humble servants who sometimes stutter. Humble servants who get questions asked of them that you, that you just don't know the answer to. And you just have to say when you don't know the answer, I don't know. But you always say that's a good question. Because people like to hear that. <laughs> Ambassador does not is not here for their personal benefit. They're, Paul says, I preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I preach, I declare to you the testimony of God. Paul says, you're ambassadors for Christ. We declare that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself through Jesus. And you need to have that, you need to accept that by faith. The fourth one is that as an ambassador, we are given written instructions to proclaim on behalf of our sending nation or God. If you're looking at, spiritually speaking, given, and he says, you have given the, the ministry or the word of reconciliation. And we know the verse in Romans 10, 17 that says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the context of, of Romans 10, 17 is the gospel. It's the gospel. We grow when we get into God's word, but that context of that verse is that faith comes by hearing. Saving faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished or equipped for every good work. An ambassador is given written instructions to proclaim on behalf of their sending nation, in our case, our God. The fifth one and the final one is this. An ambassador is recalled when they are in imminent danger or hostilities and is sent back to their sending home or nation. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we have had to you, how that you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He has raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And I believe what he's talking about there, of course, is the rapture of the church before the tribulation takes place. But we are ambassadors for Christ. We are given a holy calling with a holy purpose. We are given a message that's not ours. We're given a message by God who says, you are my ambassador. You represent me. You are to be my distinguished agent or envoy or representative on this world, in this world because you're not from the world. I'm sending you to a place that you're not a citizen of. 
Because your citizenship is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we go forth as his ambassadors, not in our own strength, not on our, in our own strength, but in his strength, taking the banner of his love and the glorious message of the gospel of the grace of God who can save anyone. I think sometimes we wonder about why people aren't getting saved, and I think probably more the issue is, is instead of that, why aren't we giving more people an opportunity to be saved? And I think that's on all of us. God gives us divine appointments, and we walk right by them sometimes. I think sometimes God puts that in your mind to go talk to that person, and sometimes we move on. I do, and I know you do too from time to time. But I think sometimes we need to say, God, this is on you, and I'm going forward in the power of your spirit, and I'm going to say what you want me to say, whatever happens, whether they like me or not. And I think when that happens, when we are obedient to the call of God as ambassadors, you know, sometimes we look around and we say, man, things are pretty stagnant. I don't think it gets stagnant when you go out there with the gospel. I think people come to know the Lord or people don't like you, but something's going to happen <laughs> one way or the other. And, and God just calls us to be faithful, right? To be faithful to him. Let's pray. Um, Lord, this is a pretty sobering text. And um, um, as my brother prayed for me this morning and, and talked about hiding behind the cross of Christ, your cross, um, Father, I have to because I, I, can't, I can't do any of this without you. And I thank you, Lord, for your love for me because I don't deserve it now and I didn't deserve it then. And yet, it's not about me, it's about you. And Lord, we th I thank you for my, fi my, my trusting you as Savior. I thank you for my brother leading me to you and talking to me about my faith. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for making me a new creation. And Lord, I know I'm echoing everybody in this room. Uh, if we know you, Lord, we're new. Lord, we still struggle, and you know that better than even we do. And yet, Lord, by faith, you, you still love us, and by grace, you haven't, you haven't decided to just walk away from us. But you still call us your ambassadors, and you, decide to, you desire to use us. I thank you, Father, for this truth of this passage. I thank you for the honor to be your representative. And I, I, Lord, I pray for the power to do it right, and to do it like you want us to do it. In Christ's name. Amen.